everyone, and welcome to Cut and Splice. Uh, today we are going to be discussing Dark City. This is one of those movies that you know came out in February of 1998, so I was still uh, 12. I hadn't turned 13 yet. Uh, it, it's one of those movies that shouldn't work, that the studios basically decided to do everything that it, that they could to make it not work, at least financially, and yet it does. On it, and it does in, in such a, a masterful and unique way that it has produced this massive cult following. And I found myself over the years, uh, since I, I, I saw the, the, the theatrical cut first, but um, also a lot of people forget that um, when they released the director's cut on DVD, Roger Ebert actually volunteered to record his own director's commentary for free because he loved the movie so much. This movie, to me, is a perfect example of a bygone era of what cinema used to be and what it should still be, in that it's original, in that it's not based off of any pre existing material it's an original screenplay it's unique it's risky it's uh gritty it's fun it has elements of science fiction it has elements of horror it has elements of noir crime drama mystery it's one of the few movies that incorporates amnesia without turning into a, a lifetime movie. And it deals with really complicated ideas about what it is to actually be a human being. So, I mean, when I was a young idiot kid, it, it was just something that kind of looked cool and it had its moments that were kind of cheesy, uh, which I, I, even still like like nowadays uh and uh but as i've gotten older and as i've watched it more and more my appreciation for the movie has only grown and i will add it's a movie where the uh, lead character looks like the director joe wright <laughs> <laughs> i don't know why but like i watched that movie and, and i know uh rufus swell right that's his name well yeah um, seawall, yeah. the, uh, seawall, sorry. Um, I, I know him. I also um, I saw him in the Amazon series, the, uh, the one with the Nazis. Um, oh, yeah. The uh, 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 High Castle. High Castle, yeah. I watched the first yeah. season of that. He was good in that, too. But uh, but I don't know. I, I watched this movie again, and all I could think of is, wow, he looks like Joe Wright. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would have gone that direction, but I mean, you know, like I, he doesn't not look like Joe Wright. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I think listened to a podcast with Joe Wright and like uh, Roger Deakins, so it's uh, it's funny. Yeah, it's just I, on my mind today specifically too. It's kind of funny that yeah. I just watched this movie the other day, and then I the podcast I listened to today. I think it's more that they just have the same haircut. Yeah, yeah, they they also have <laughs> if you look at it. Uh, it's uh, I think it's like. Does he have blue eyes? Is there something there? It's uh, it's okay. It's all good. It's it's just funny because I guess a lot of people also compare um, Christopher Nolan to DiCaprio, and like they said when they made Inception, that well, maybe the shape of their face. That's about it. Yeah, something about the hair. The hair is like really slick, oh, and hair, obviously yeah. DiCaprio looks better, or at least to some people. I actually I find them very squinty eyes. Like I don't, but um, but yes, no, it's 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 funny. Uh, Somebody made a point at some point, like for the first time, someone looks better than the director because Christopher Nolan is usually the most attractive person, <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Oh, it's all the fan like boys the, of Christopher Nolan. In any yeah. case, uh, but going back to Dark City, uh, what about you, Jason? Uh, I guess um, you just recently, very recently, rewatched it, and um, what was your interest in in like going back to it? Um, I've always loved this movie since the first time I saw it. 
I was going to ask you guys uh, not to get sidetracked because I, I mean, I, I did want to answer that question, but uh, I wanted to ask you guys, none of us saw this in theater, right? Like, I mean, we all saw it after it had been out for a while, right? Correct. For me, at least. Yes, I think I saw it like probably mid 2000s if I, yeah. Okay. No, I just wanted to check because, you know, I mean, this is like, like Matt was saying, it, it really is a great example of like a, you know, almost like a cult classic because it didn't do anything, you know, remarkable in when it was in theaters or anything. And largely because of the, uh, the decisions that they made to, to change it the way they changed it. Um, if this director's cut is anything to go off of at least. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I just, it's one of those movies for me that there's probably, I've never made a list of this or anything, but I would say there's probably at least a half dozen or a dozen movies or so where, you know, um, you know, it's it's one of those ones where you see it for the first time, you know, on DVD or something when you were um, younger and, and suddenly you go, oh my gosh, I, people had said something about this or I'd heard about it or something like that. And you go, how on earth did I never see this? It's got such a ca great cast and it's such a good movie. And, you know, and, and it's <laughs> more than likely influenced a lot of other movies <laughs> and other things. And um, it's just, you know, it, it's one of those ones where it was like, I would, when I remember seeing it and just thinking I was so happy to see this movie, it was so right up my alley. And that was the theatrical version, which kind of sucks compared to the uh, the director's cut, which is significantly better in many ways. So, um, you know, and then Matt was talking about it a lot at the time. And I just thought, you know, this would definitely be a good one to talk about, like like he was saying. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I actually think that uh, I think I had a stronger reaction to it the first time I saw it. I think it had a better impression on me this this one was it was very solid if nothing else it felt very fast it felt the, it was very fast paced it almost felt rushed so i can't even imagine now what the theatrical version looks like but maybe i would i was younger so a, a rushed cut felt fine to me back then uh, but i remember having a very strong reaction to it when i felt like i always called it the um the indie version of the matrix essentially yeah uh, in a way because uh, it's it's not heavy on action there's some action but it's more suspense detective story almost like chinatown um type of thing noir so it's definitely different than um than than the matrix but very similar in themes and and conclusions and things of that sort no, not completely but but, well, but in plot points too Sorry, and plot points too. Yeah, and we can get to it uh, in the second half of the show. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yes, so I, it's it's tough to measure it because really I, I remembered very little about this movie. Actually, the ending, which we'll get to, I remembered it differently. It'd be funny to see what you guys like think of my. Mm -hmm. I, I actually thought it ended differently. Um, so so little things like that actually actually surprised me. And but more than anything, I appreciated that it's. It's it was very fast paced. It's 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 like along, along those lines of movies, say like The Dark Knight and others, where there's constant nonstop action, or or at least in this case, not per se action, but but a lot is happening, but it's not yeah. overwhelming. It's handled very well, and it's not too confusing, unlike Tenet. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, so you go along with it. And then towards the end, it really comes together well in, in a yeah. very satisfying way. And, and it's not a cop-out way. I, I mentioned, I think, on I made a post about just, just watch like um, was a midnight special, the one by uh, right. that, that director. Uh, <laughs> and, and that one also I felt like it was the com complete opposite in a way, which is funny. It's a very slow movie, almost too slow in the beginning, even though I like slow movies. But towards the end, it picked up and it really made a good point. Um, and, yeah. um, and, and and there wasn't a cop out in the end. There was actual conclusion to the mystery. And it was a satisfying conclusion, maybe not as satisfying as a movie like Dark City, because it really just, uh, it, Dark City yeah. to me feels like a, a very, very good 
Star Trek episode. It would be like a top 10 Star Trek episode. If, um, yeah. uh, and boy. incidentally, uh, by the way, uh, saving any conversations about the ending for later, uh, that is a major reason to watch the director's cut and not the theatrical cut because the uh, the studios really forced the hand of uh, Alex Proyas for the theatrical cut. And basically, uh, Kiefer Sutherland's character, Daniel Schrader, has a voiceover at the beginning of the movie that basically gives away 90% of it. Uh, so, I, I mean, if you watch the theatrical cut first, it really takes some mental work to watch the theatrical, to watch the director's cut and realize, holy crap, this is what this movie was always supposed to be and try to actually experience it the way that the director intended. The the theatrical cut just kind of like, you know, it's like the movie Snake Eyes with, uh, you know, Nicolas Cage that was directed by Brian De Palma. It was like built as a mystery history was solved in the first 20 minutes yeah uh, the director's cut is uh it, it, yeah see that first then watch the thing cut, and then realize why we're so blessed to have the director's cut. yeah and you can definitely we can bring it up uh, for sure in the second half because uh I, I am curious i have so little recollection of the first one except for my general impressions and and the ending that i rem or at least the way i remembered it so yeah, I think that is interesting. But overall, as far as like my impression, I do think it's a it's a really solid movie. I would definitely recommend it, especially for people that are maybe younger now and mm -hmm. and haven't seen it and because it's been under the radar and, and maybe they know about The Matrix and they know about some of the other movies from like the late 90s. Uh, but yeah, like this one and Equilibrium are two movies that are, I feel like for younger people now, if if they haven't seen them, are definitely movies that are worth their time to see where where the sci-fi fiction was at the time. There were some daring uh, moves happening in the late 90s. Yeah. Yep. And also, and this is another element of the film that I, I found to be particularly affecting, especially watching it uh, more than uh, almost a quarter century after its release, um, how well the visual effects stand up for the most yeah. part. One or two I, crazy moments, but other than that, pretty great. Yeah, I mean, there, there were a few times when, yeah, the only time to do it, uh, the only way to do it was using CGI, so you're seeing late 90s CGI, but most of the scenes like with the city changing around you and these really uh, intricate, very momentous and, you know, grandiose visual effects shots, they were done in camera. They were done with miniatures and doing stop motion and all that stuff. That shit hold, held up. <laughs> like all that stuff looks it looks better today than a lot of the stuff that we're seeing nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in in that sense, I mean, it's a visual masterpiece. I mean, it, I mean, obviously, Daria Smolsky, uh, you know, the the cinematographer did some amazing color noir work on uh, on the film too. But uh, I mean, the the visual effects team really pulled something special off with this um, uh, that you know really shouldn't be lost on people. And I mean, you compare it to the second Matrix movie where, you know, you got Neo fighting, you know, that horde of Smiths that basically looks like a, a PlayStation one game to, to dark city and uh, that, which came out years before it. I mean, there's no comparison. I mean, dark city was, Dark City has better visual effects. <laughs> so, well, um, I mean, that's kind of a weird <laughs> comparison considering that they were doing something that had never really been done before with that thing. And, you know, I mean, granted, um, they failed in the sense that they didn't give their people enough time to clean up the, the animations. And so it looks as bad as you're talking about. 
but I mean, it, they they were using that whole thing of like putting green screen style mask on a bunch of you know stuntmen to give them all you know the same face that could actually be where they could actually have Hugo Weaving's like um, express and you know you know make ex, you know faces and such and you know try to pull that off. That's not exactly the same thing as having a bunch of extras around you. I, I mean, it's fair to say that. Uh, the Matrix gals now uh, uh, were, you know, they were they were pushing the envelope in uh, in terms of technology there, but I think that there's a lot of uh, and and actually we we can talk about Proyas's later career when he kind of went full CGI on like <laughs> iRobot yes. and and, uh, and knowing. In that, you know, maybe, you know, that that's a, a symptom of people using technology before it was ready to be used. But, uh, I, I mean, I think Dark City was just a perfect example of, uh, I mean, that's the thing. If Dark City were made in 2004, it probably wouldn't have looked as good. Oh, well, yeah. I, I think because, uh, uh, yeah, those guys uh, on the corridor crew talk about this all the time, about how, like, in some ways, you, you know, depending on how you're talking about it, you there's a, definitely an argument to be made that the 90s had, like, some of the best movies ever. And one of the, the easiest ways to make that statement is to talk about visual effects because, you know, things like, you know, the people who took the time to do things right – like, you know, um, uh, you know, this movie and, you know, the first Matrix film and Jurassic Park and all those ones like that, you have a little bit of CGI that's just enough to make things amazing, but not to look trashy. And then suddenly people started using it as like a crutch and you had a good six or seven years where everything looked like Ang Lee's The Hulk movie, you know? Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, interesting. Um, so um, you feel like we should... Uh move on to the second half. I felt yeah, like sure. uh, any other thoughts yeah. about um, uh, about oh, recommendation? Uh, I, I was just going to say real quickly, um, not having anything to do with the plot or anything like that, but just the cast is like so outstanding in this movie. You know, yeah. I've always loved uh, Rufus Sewell. Uh, I think I'm saying his last name correctly, but um yeah. I you usually get to see him as a bad guy and this is like the movie where once I saw it that's like from then on in my head I just thought of him as Murdoch you know like this one of those movies that leave that kind of imprint you know <laughs> kind of thing and, uh, <laughs> imprint is the right word God, yeah there you go <laughs> um, he, he's so good as even though he, he kind of stands around in that trench coat most of the movie and yeah. uh you know, Keeper Sutherland definitely looked like he was like trying to do something with that doctor character and kind of making him memorable. And uh, this is definitely one of the when you look at William Hurt's career of questionable movies and fantastic performances, this is definitely one of the fantastic performances, you know. Uh, but uh, I was going to say the the thing that that caught my attention really well on this watch was that. Um, you know, I mean, Jennifer Connelly obviously is always excellent and gorgeous. But um, this uh, I was thinking about those scenes that there's two scenes where she sings a pretty decent amount of uh, a song in those um, those like nightclub type scenes. Yeah. You know, and it always makes me think when I see those scenes like that in movies, um, I, I don't know. um how good or or how um comfortable jennifer connelly is with scene it just made me think about like uh i i think it's uh i think it was the director commentary or something like that on um blue velvet where uh he was saying you know like those nightclub scenes where they have um i, I believe it's uh, isabella, rosalini. isabella rosalini yeah where she's yes. singing that He's saying like, yeah, we we she, we just told her that you know she was very nervous. She didn't want to do it. He said, you know, was very nervous about doing it. I should say. He says like, 
just do the best you can. And then we, we filmed it a bunch of times through and we had enough to edit together a performance, you know, kind of thing. And I'm sure, you know, based on the way he was describing it, it doesn't really sound like she would, you know, disagree with that sort of thing. I, I, that's not the only example. There's like so many examples of, of actors who had to sing something in a performance and they just kind of make it work, you know, with movie magic. And I, I just wonder when I watch this one, because I have no idea if she's really good at singing or not, but it's, it's, it looks and sounds fantastic. Yeah, I, actually, the funny thing, oh, yeah, go sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was mostly going to say, it, it's actually one of the only cringe worthy moments for me. I, I don't know what it is, but it's, maybe I'm more sensitive to musical things. It, it felt a bit too, too good for sure. Uh, it doesn't sound exactly like her voice. And obviously they always, even if it is the voice of the, of the actor, they, they record it in the studio, not on set. So it's always sweetened and sounds very different, but, but I don't know why it felt a bit too much, like almost as if it didn't fit her be a singer. Well, yeah. Sounds it, that I guess that's why I, I my brain immediately went to that memory of that other movie and that, that and the director saying that because it does it it rings as artificial you know if that makes sense. Yes, and and I sort of I, I forgive it because I, I'm I know that this movie, especially knowing that I've seen it before, that it's very hyper. It it almost feels at times that. Even like the audio is is like not perfectly in sync when people are talking. There, there's something about it that's very almost like a spaghetti western. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I don't know, but it's yeah. it's just very uh, it's very hyper. Um, I don't know what's the word. Not hyper realistic. That's the opposite. But but just hyper real uh, dramatized. Oh. Yeah, um, and that's why I forgive it. I almost feel like a movie that is is so over the top. It's okay for it to have moments like that because it's just trying to set up this world that's just a little bit off kilt, and then it pays off in the end when you when uh, the mystery is, is resolved. Uh, yeah. But I, 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 I uh, well, uh, so, since we're in the uh, spoilers are okay portion, yeah. uh, oh, do you oh, think yeah. it's so let's let's start the second half then? Yes, because we didn't officially get to there. Cause Jason yeah, and right. Well, oh, well, I, I mean, I I just think it might be worth actually talking about. Like what the movie's about, and, it's, it's a good and, 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 and so, like the so plot. Here, here we go. The spoilers. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, that, man. So we're basically set off on this journey with John to figure out exactly what's going on in this world, and uh, and what his place is in it. And uh, pretty early on, John uh, discovers that he has the same ability as a stranger's to tune to kind of manipulate the world around him, but he doesn't really know what it means. Um, so I, I guess that's... Uh, the first sign is that he he can be put to sleep. That's one of right. the tell signs that he's got some sort of powers. Yeah. But in the, uh, um, in the director's cut, they do, I don't know at what point in the movie, but he does mention that halfway through it or something, that they brought um, them here to some degree or another. He didn't say the word aliens, but he did say that it's basically all part of an experiment. And that's that's revealed. Yes. We just don't know what that experiment is, but we do find out halfway through the movie that there is something going yeah. on and there is like these overlords that are con controlling basically the world to every extent. The only thing that's not revealed is the final mystery of where they are and and who are they or what's their existence, which technically... I'm not sure, but it's that's uh, and then we can get to that. Like, what does happen in the end? Um, are they actual humans, or are they copies of humans that were experimented on? So that's I think that's might even be left uh, interpretation in a way. Um, I I think that the um, uh, you know the, the kind of the parts you were just talking about and everything. The um, I, I think that the theatrical I mean sorry the um director's cut definitely does a really good job like you were just kind of mentioning of um it, of slowly revealing layer after layer after layer because they give you enough 
to um you know to just to make your brain start thinking and everything but um it, it's kind of like when you're comparing the effect of the director's cut and the uh, theatrical the the first five minutes of the theatrical where there's this voiceover that just explains everything um takes away all well not all but let's say 90 percent of the mystery and it just becomes kind of a thriller at that point because you're just a suspense type of thing because you more or less know what's going on you're on the ride with murdoch with the discovery but you know you know i mean yeah. you, you don't know to what extent you're still waiting for it to be revealed visually to you but you more or less know um the biggest reveals that are going to come you just don't know how and when and and you know what it's going to look like so that epic moment when all the characters are coming together you know the um uh the wife and murdoch and the detective and the strangers and they they all are drawn to that one spot at the, the beach, Shell beach. Yeah. yeah Shell beach, and they bust through the wall i mean in the theatrical version i mean in, in yeah, the theatrical version you're basically just you know they're aliens you know they're in space and that they're not on earth you know that it's you know that it's some sort of thing like that and you're basically just going well okay he he says you know that there's nothing there he says that they you know whatever and and, he, and Kiefer Sutherland is kind of giving them clues and you already know they're in space so you have to just sort of assume they're going to get to the edge of the ship at some point and sure enough it happens and that it, it's a nice visual reveal but that's it whereas in the theatrical it's kind of amazing it, because, the director's cut I'm sorry uh, yes you're, you're yeah. right sorry director's cut it's kind of amazing because all those pieces are coming together and like you said they they kind of drop these, I wouldn't call them hints, but they, they give you just enough information to where you start going, oh, wow, okay, okay, okay. And then it just builds and builds and builds up to that moment where they bust through the wall. And sure enough, you know, it's it's revealed and it's so great that the the uh, William Hurt's character, the, the inspector, you know, um, his little story in this, you know, is that he's just looking for the truth and, massive spoiler um sadly he dies fighting in that moment and you know kind of semi protecting those people but in doing so when him and the other stranger like float off into space he gets to finally see and grasp the full you know uh scope of everything and right before he dies like sees the very nature of everything that he's been searching for so it's kind of a, right. a massive moment that works yeah, and, and that's actually kind of an important you know element like uh you just think about it, both the theatrical cut and the director's cut early in the movie have that action scene uh with murdoch and the strangers in front of that billboard sure where one of the strangers is killed and he actually sees one of those you know, creepy crawly thingies crawling out of the dead stranger's skull. So you know something's amiss here. <laughs> you know, like you, you, uh, it, you know, there's probably an alien presence. There's probably something. There's something not human, not of this world going on. But in the in the director's cut, you're left with this question of: Is this an alien invasion? Precisely. Whereas in the theatrical cut, uh, the the voiceover from uh, Daniel Schrader, uh, uh, um, Kiefer Sutherland's character, tells you right away, they brought us here. So you know that they're on a ship, you, or you know that they're somewhere other than Earth. <laughs> yeah, that's that's crazy because I don't remember that. And maybe, maybe that's a good thing. And that's why I have very good experience when I first watched it. Uh, I, now I, I want to watch it. Like I have to now rent it just for those five minutes so I can like listen to that audio or like um, to that. Um, wh when did the director's cut come out? Like recently? No, I uh, think it came out in the early 2000s. 
So I wonder if, if that's the one that I've always seen. Maybe I've never seen the actual like theatrical cut. But yes, it's it's uh it's blasphemy. I, I think I think if, if he did reveal that it's actual aliens, then then yes, it does it does uh, take away the mystery. Because the biggest thing about this movie is are they humans? Are they on Earth? Uh, are they dancer? Uh, uh, I, I, what? Uh, uh, sorry, I was just making a joke about the killers. Are they human or are they dancer? <laughs> but uh, uh, no, okay. go ahead. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, but but uh, but yes, it's it's what's what's reality. That's why I mentioned the whole Star Trek reference. It's it's the allegory of the cave thing. Uh, it also touches on things that Inception was touching on, but didn't do it as effectively. If life is an illusion, is it still worthwhile living? Um, mm. And the answer is the wife said yes. It's she close to the end. She says like it's okay. I'm okay with it. If if life was an illusion, if it's all just made up as long as I'm happy, as long as I have a life, as long as I have someone to love. And, and that's what he essentially creates in the end. It's basically, they're still stuck. They're still living in, in essentially what would be considered the matrix or, or um, a simulation of what life is, not real life. But who says that real life is not a simulation? Uh, at least now the, the overlord is the good guy, sort of, you know, hopefully he doesn't turn into a bad guy. Uh, but and not the the real bad guys, the the baldies. <laughs> um, so yes. so yeah, so that's like ultimately what the movie is about. And I'm not sure why I didn't pick up on it the first time I watched it. That that voiceover, and maybe it just I missed it or I didn't catch it. And because I, when I first watched it, it really took me by surprise. And for some reason, I recalled them being on a planet. It, it's just that it wasn't Earth. And and I think it's just my memory playing games with me because the last scene is on a beach, but technically they're still in space. It's just that he created a, an ocean around the ship, essentially. Um, yeah. So for some reason, my memory remembered it as they're coming out. They're not on Earth. They're on some distant planet because there's something on Earth-like about it. But he created something that looks like a beach, which is a memorable or at least something that's humans have a strong connection to bodies of water and beaches it's something that we were were attracted to um so that's he creates the illusion of well we can't go back to earth we don't know where we are we can't but at least i can create this illusion of normalcy and, yeah. and we can at least like make that work and it's bittersweet but it's it really like had a strong effect on me the first time the second time was oh it's a ship I didn't remember that. Uh, it still yeah. works, but you know, I I kind of like the planet idea better. Um, but but it still works. It it works on so many levels. It's just a bit strange. How can you really build a beach around the ship? It's a bit of a reach. And maybe that's why my mind, because I have this issue, I tend to try to fix movies, especially yeah. if I like them in my memory. So we all do that. So, 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 <laughs> like I like like with the arrival episode, we'll get to that too. But the uh, <laughs> But I just, I just Good felt example. like, felt like that's that's a bit too much. The water around the ship, and then how does the sun rise? Because he changed the where the ship is directed. That where are where are the clouds coming from? Where's the atmosphere? <laughs> you know, it's a bit of a reach. But again, it's 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 well, a fictional it, it, movie. It, it's, it's, a, it's also, a, <laughs> I mean, it's also a bit of a reach that you know buildings can just lift themselves eight stories high and expand and create win windows right then and there at the, you know, you know, just because somebody thought it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but that's I mean, going to be the alien technology, which, which I guess yeah. could also create a beach and an atmosphere. Right. And well, uh, well, and that, that's the whole thing is that Murdoch can control the alien technology, but, I get your point. I get your point. Yeah, uh, the, and, the and, and, by, by, create matter. Uh, Huh? I mean, the the especially at the end when you see, beforehand you see how big the city is. Like the I, I think of it, it. This is like those images have got to be like a total wet dream for flat earthers. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Flat earthers, uh, 
do watch this movie. This one's for you. Oh yeah, definitely for you. you you'll love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, you see how big it is in those few moments where they show it floating in space. And then you see at the end when he adds the water, he adds quite a bit of water all the way around it. And you don't see like, like, like what Gil was trying to imagine in his head, the planet underneath it's, it's basically just a big, a bunch of, you know, circle spheres and weird shapes and things like that, that are underneath the city. There isn't a lot of mass down there, you know? Yeah. So really you, the, um, if we're going to believe the visuals and we're going to believe that he turned on all those faucets more or less <laughs> and created this massive body of water in a donut shape around the city you have to believe that a they've got some sort of force field thing that holds the atmosphere in which we kind of saw a little bit of evidence of with the the scene where they bust the hole in the wall but also yeah. you have to kind of also figure the only way to logically believe what we're seeing at the end is that Murdoch and the other aliens with it when they can tune they're not just rearranging matter they have to be able to somehow create matter because I mean he just basically yeah. creates water that's more or less doubles the mass of the entire thing that they're living on yeah uh, that's fair uh, at the same time it's one of those things where like if this were a 10-hour miniseries or like a complete tv series if this were like the expanse and they uh, you know ended the show with some kind of massive thing like this and you know gave us no explanation i would nitpick it but one of the beauties of this movie is that it is a movie and it's self-contained and they yes. never intended there to be a sequel it's just like we're you know your suspension of disbelief is kind of set pretty early you know, this is kind of the world that we're living in. And yeah, the end of the movie, I, I yeah, I, I'm pretty sure if you picked Alex Proyas's and Davis, uh, David S. Goyer's brains about it, uh, uh, you know, they, they couldn't tell you why he was able to do it. The point is that at that point, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> um, He's Neil. <laughs> yeah. right oh and by the way uh okay so the matrix just talking about two interesting things that were stolen from dark city the matrix actually used a lot of the same sets that dark city did uh, <laughs> uh but second of all come on requiem for a dream jennifer connelly out on the pier <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that, that's true. I, I forgot about that one. <laughs> well, that, 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 that dark stole from uh, wait, is uh, Requiem came after? Yeah, Requiem came after. Oh, when did Requiem come out? Two thousand, two thousand one. Wow. Oh, wow, that's um, okay. I could have sworn that was a '90s movie, but interesting. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's very. Yeah, Requiem came out. Yeah, Requiem came out in 2000. See, we, we all feel this way because none of us saw this in 1998. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's see, you live and you learn. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, no, that's, it's all interesting stuff. But, but, but I guess ultimately, as far as like talking about the themes and, and the ending and everything, uh, it does feel like if, if he did say at some point, whether it's theatrical or the director's cut, that they brought them there, that maybe they were essentially kidnapped humans that were brought to um to this ship for this experiment, um, and then ultimately what it was about is it was trying to um, they're trying to get to the essence of what is being a human, which again is the Star Trek reference. Star Trek is very big on, on that, and, mm -hmm. and and what is that essence that that thing that you can't really duplicate. I actually think this is a very good movie to either revisit or or watch, like I said, like a new generation of moviegoers, just because it's it says something a little bit about AI. Because right now we're doing this. We're trying to experiment with how can we duplicate what it means to be a human and put that into a computer. Um, and, and we don't even know, like we can't even figure it out completely. Uh, so it's an interesting subject 
uh, or, or like an interesting way to approach that subject without going directly for the AI approach, but but going into like the reverse work. Aliens are like examining us, uh, but it's um, it's it's definitely very unique, and that's why I definitely forgive anything that maybe comes off as either cringy or or not very realistic. And so it's it's a very very good movie, uh, and I'm very happy that it was made because it's it definitely made me made me think. Yeah, especially the first time I saw it, it, it kind of blew my mind. It, it was it was pretty. The, the the ending was was really really good. Yeah, it really surprised me. Yeah, and I mean like the the visuals, the the music by uh, Trevor Jones, I think it was, yep. who kind of fell off the radar after Dark City. Um, really good. Uh, Performances. I I think it's Kiefer Sutherland's best performance, possibly. Oh, I don't know about that. Uh, well, it's up That's there. As uh, good as a character uh, actor type of performance. Yeah. <laughs> all, all going all uh, Igor there. Yeah, I, I mean it. It's it's funkier than he's usually willing to do. I mean he's <laughs> he's usually Kiefer Sutherland playing Kiefer Sutherland. In this case, uh, it, it didn't seem like he was playing Kiefer Sutherland. It seemed like he was really embodying somebody else. And uh, Rufus Sewell, it's actually kind of interesting. I, I read somewhere that um, Rufus Sewell was talking about Dark City, and he had nothing but praise for the movie. And he actually just said, I wish that I had just turned in a better performance. Huh. And I, I was like, uh, I, I mean, it's just one of those things where I, I, I don't want to go off the rails, but I, I look at Rufus Sewell's performance in that. And I, I mean, like, you know, you can think about the noir elements of it and maybe think, OK, maybe you should have had the screen presence like Humphrey Bogart or maybe you should have been able to bring in like a Gary Oldman intensity to it. And I mean, you know, 90 percent of male performances, if you bring in Gary Oldman, you're going to be upgrading. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I think the fact that he was kind of an every man made it stronger like the fact that he wasn't popping off the screen made the overall movie better william hurt gave a relatively subdued performance and compared to the rest of his career and he was better as a result of it uh so i mean i i i mean i think this is just one of those things where I mean, Alex Proyas has had um, a roller coaster of a career, uh, to put it lightly. But I mean, to me, this is his magnum opus. I mean, this is, I mean, you know, if I were him, yeah, you know, this would be the thing that I would just say, like, if you're going to watch one movie that I made, this is it. Oh, it's um, definitely his best film, for sure. Yeah, I mean the crow was good, but yeah. it's not it's well, it not dark city. Like, um, uh, uh, you know what would you call it? Uh, one of those um, uh, cult classic kind of films for sure. But yeah, uh, it uh, and and it's it's a classic in and of itself. But, but those are his two best movies, and Dark City is far superior. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No, but I, I gotta say about the as far as like the the acting, uh, I, I do feel like the subdued thing ha uh, worked well. I, I do feel I, I wonder if if maybe Kiefer Sutherland would have gone a little bit more toned down, might have benefited it because I, I did like that William Hurt and uh, and Rufus Sewell uh, that they were very subdued. This connects a bit to the whole tenant conversation that we had about the the main character being being not too uh, necessarily charismatic, but just, so there is something to be said, like it, it works in this movie, it didn't work for, especially for for you guys uh, in Tenet. Um, and, and it makes sense to some degree because that one's supposed to be an agent and um, a special person. This one's supposed to be like an everyday guy, but I did feel like that he, he has a special look, Rufus. And, oh. uh, but there is something to be said where like Jack Nicholson and, and um, or how Humphrey Borgard 
you know, like Chinatown is, is a great example of like somebody who's trying to solve a mystery, but his charisma in every scene is so apparent that, and it makes the movie. Uh, but yes, here specifically, it, it works. And maybe that's true. It's better than in Tenant because we were supposed to be as confused as him. And it was good that he was confused. And it was good that he, even though he has a unique look, he didn't per se had very strong presence because uh, then we were focusing on the details and not about him um, in, in, oh, in a way of like a character study. So I, I do think that that was a strength for the movie, the, the subtlety yeah. in the acting. Well, I mean, the the thing is, like, you know, when you compare John Murdoch to, uh, you know, those other characters that you mentioned, I mean, like, he's supposed to be lacking any of that confidence that goes along with them. Like, they know who they are and where they are and why they are where they are. And he literally doesn't know who he is. And, I mean, the, and... You know, again, you know, especially once it's discovered that everybody is just living the implanted memories that these people are, that these strangers are injecting into their minds, nobody knows who he or she actually is. And I mean, and that's the real question uh, uh, you know that's a real question that you know the strangers were driving at that the movie is driving at is like are we really just the products of our past selves or is there something innate within us that makes us different you know like if you could literally wipe out somebody's past and turn him into whatever you know it, it, is there something it, is there something innate or inherent in the human existence that transcends our prior causes, that transcends our environments, uh, that even transcends our memories? Uh, and I mean, that really gets at a really core philosophical question uh, and, uh, and a rather polarizing one. <laughs> but um uh and 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 the funny thing is the way that the movie ends i don't think it really 100 percent offers an answer because you know the way that uh murdoch ends up bringing the whole system down isn't by beating his prior causes it's by schrader injecting him with new prior causes and new prior knowledge <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, in a way, the movie's actually making an argument against free will while making an argument for free will while making an argument against free will. But, I mean, that that's basically how all those arguments turn out, isn't it? Uh, so. <laughs> no, but yeah, it's a, it's a good place to bring it to a conclusion. Uh, I, I don't know how I feel about it either. Uh, I know that in some of your comments about it or posts, you, you maybe brought that up a bit. Um, but... It does feel like that that's the whole point of the movie is that we are, they know, so what they do know is that if they implant memories, they can have a certain trajectory for a life, but there's this slight element of chaos or, or, or just influence that go beyond just memories. That's maybe the essence of a person. Um, yeah. That's, which, which is, Technically, it's DNA. I mean, that's essentially because it's all is the combination of genetics and circumstances. Uh, there's something about our genetic makeup that that does create this, whether it's an illusion or not, of free will. Uh, it does create this element of chaos. Of uh, that's uh, you can't really completely predict people's actions based on. That's something that I don't think anybody has ever been able to do. Again, I guess social yeah. media and stuff, they try to do that now. They, they have this thing about like, you know, algorithms that try to figure out what you want to watch next or what ads you might respond to more. And, and ultimately, we're, we're a stubborn bunch. The, the thing with humans is that we're rebellious. Uh, like yeah. if we notice that somebody is feeding us what we want too many times, we'll go the other way. 
it's it's um it's you see that with kids like i see with my kids too so so it's this spark to humans that rebellious mm -hmm. spark that that exists that goes beyond memories and beyond um that's yeah so i think that's a little bit of what it's about i mean as far as what they're we're, we're seeking what's that spark how can we uh yeah you can't just like say like like we said program an ai and say like well just randomly every once in a while make him feel like he wants to rebel that's not a good idea <laughs> yeah i don't think it's a good idea yeah. especially for an ai um but with humans humans do do some horrible acts and they kill a lot of people so yes that, that agent of chaos might not be a good thing uh, but at the same time there's this other beauty to humanity and 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 positive aspect that that maybe i guess the aliens wanted wanted to duplicate whether we want to duplicate it that's another question but uh yeah but yeah that's uh, i think that's a lot of it of what like the movie's about and it's all curious and, and obviously like anything else I, I would leave it up to the interpretation of the of the viewer but uh but again it's uh, it's good that there's those movies out there that bring up all those questions yeah so uh do we want to do our Ranking out of 10 stars out of, uh, rankings 10. yeah uh I'll, I'll go last because i already know what mine is i i never really thought about um where i would rank this thing um it's definitely uh i think it's like a really great movie so i mean um for me i'd probably put it around like a like an eight or a nine yeah, I think if I'm not mistaken, I um, I think I ranked it back then. I stopped ranking movies recently, but I, I saw it on IMDb that I, I did rank it back then. I think I gave it an eight, which might be what I would give it now. Uh, I There's some flaws to it. Yeah, I gave it an eight. Uh, it's, I, I would say, no, actually, yeah, no, because I, I said that I had a bigger impression of it the first time I watched it. So even back then, it was probably like an eight and a half, like bordering, uh, bordering on nine. It's just that it, it wasn't there just yet. And my reaction now is too, is like, oh, wow, this is very good. Uh, maybe close to a nine. I just, I can't, uh, for some reason, there's too many things that like bother me slightly about it. So I would probably stick to like a, an eight. Yeah, I'm pretty much uh, in the nine, nine and a half. If I were allowed to do halves, I would just say nine and a half. No one's saying you can't. Yeah, I mean, there are just like one or two little shots that are just like, well, that looks really dated or they could have done that better or, you know, there, yeah, there, there are a few things that, I mean, obviously you're, I, I'm going to reserve perfect tens to movies like Ivan's Childhood or, you know, Schindler's List or, you know, White Chicks or something like that. But, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, again, it's not perfect, but to me, it's, uh, it's just one of those things where it just resonates with me. It has a special place in my heart. It, it's bold, and it's something that we don't really get very often nowadays. So, 